I would uh, like to welcome everyone today for our inaugural global seminar. Uh, so this is the first FCL global seminar that we're organizing. The idea is for us to create a space for ideas, uh, discussion, and thinking on sustainable cities and settlement systems, what we're focusing on in FCL global at the intersection of science, design, place, and time. So that's our motto, and that's what we try to explore more in detail in these uh, talks. I'm Tandi Maheshwari. I'm the Associate Director of the Lab here in uh, Singapore Hub, and uh, I have with me our inaugural speaker, Heiko Eip. Dr. Heiko Eip is, um, as you know, a little bit, uh, he's been with FCL since 2015, with SEC since 2015. He uh, held uh, multiple roles, he was the uh, coordinator for FCL's uh, responsibility scenarios uh, uh, for some time. And then he was a key member of the Cooling Singapore project. And right now he is the project leader for the Cooling Singapore project, as well as the co-investigator of the Circular Future Cities module in FCL. Um, you've heard a bit about this in a previous overture. Today, he'll be focusing on the topic of uh, digital urban twins and the work he has done on simulation as a service emerging out of uh, the Cooling Singapore project. So I'm very excited to uh, hear more about this uh, SAS framework, I Heiko and Federation of Models, and uh, I'll just hand over the mic to you to uh, begin. Thank you, Tanvi, for the introduction. And also, thank you very much for the invitation for your to be the speaker for your first seminar. I'm quite excited to be here and also talk about the things that um, we have been working on in the last roughly 12 months. Um, so yeah, as Tanvi already introduced me, I'm leading, um, actually I'm leading one of the uh, four pillars in the Cooling Singapore project. Um, the one on the digital urban climate twin research and development. And um, so maybe before I go into what this digital urban climate twin is, let me first start with the question, what is a digital urban twin? Um, I think as this goes with definitions, um, if you ask five different people of uh, what they think what a digital urban twin is, they will probably get five different opinions, but here's mine. Um, so if you look at this, this is a photo, um, it's a nice drone shot. Um, what you see in the center is actually Lao Passat. I think uh, many of you uh, know this iconic um, uh, food court uh, in the midst of the CBD. I like the photo because it also shows quite a number of um, urban elements. So for instance, you can see the buildings, high uh, skyscrapers, you can see the traffic. Um, you, see can, you can see also air conditioning. You can see probably also people as, as little spots on the ground. So this is in a way the, the real city, that's a photo of the real city. Um, this here is a screenshot that I took from uh, Google Earth, um, which is actually, I, I didn't know it, I, I, I looked for it and I realized actually Google Earth has a pretty good um, 3D model of Singapore, at least of the uh, CBD and, and many other areas. So that's basically roughly the same area. Again, you can see the uh, Lao Passat in the center, um, but that's obviously not real, that's, that's, that's a model. So some people may also think, oh yeah, that's already a twin, right? That's an urban twin, um, because it, it looks like the, almost like the real city, like the photo. Um, to me, there's really two things um, that I've kind of split it up a bit. On the left-hand side, you just see the photo, of course, but then on the right-hand side, um, my colleague um, Isabel has highlighted kindly some of these elements that that we are also interested when we talk about digital urban twins. And these are sort of the, the technical things as well. So you see the traffic swishing around, you, you see the, on the right-hand side on that building, you see the uh, air conditioning units. Um, vegetation, or in this case, rather the lack of it is also part of cities. So a digital urban twin really um, is in, to me is a composition of specialized computational models each representing an urban element of interest. So that is the buildings, the traffic, air conditioning, microclimate. Um, you can't see the microclimate, but you can certainly feel it if you are in the city. And that's also something that we can simulate. Um, so it's not only the geometry and the textures for the purpose of visualization, but also the dynamic behavior for the purpose of simulating cause and effect. And then of course, once you have such a digital urban twin, you can also use it to conduct what if analysis and perform experiments uh, with the city in silico um, that otherwise wouldn't be possible. I mean, there are certain experiments that you just can't do with the real city, right? 
Um, and that's something that you can use the digital urban twin for. Now, the next step, of course, is then what is this digital urban climate twin that Cooling Singapore is building? Um, and for that, I just want to, for those of you who are not familiar with the Cooling Singapore project, let me just um, quickly uh, introduce it in a, in a very few words. Cooling Singapore um, has been around for a couple of years, in fact, since 2017, and we are very much interested in the urban climate um, of Singapore and specifically looking into the issue of the urban heat island um, and how to mitigate it and um, a couple of other things as well. But a lot of it has to do with urban heat island mitigation and improving the outdoor thermal comfort. Now, what you may not have known is that the uh, urban heat island is uh, a phenomena in cities that can be observed. Um, basically, that the temperature in the cities is often several degrees warmer than in the surroundings. Um, and in Singapore, this effect can be up to seven degrees. Um, is a typically a nighttime effect, so up to seven degrees that has been measured sometime uh, a couple of years ago by colleagues of mine. And if we want to understand how we can mitigate the urban heat island, we need to have a model. And in this case, it's not just a model, it's really, this is where the digital urban climate twin comes into um, the picture, because we want to be able to, to simulate or ask what if persons, what happens if we use uh, electric vehicles instead of combustion engine vehicles? What happens if we use centralized air conditioning versus um, decentralized air conditioning? And so on. There's a lot of what if questions that we want to ask, um, often concerned with mitigation measures. And the question is, how do we answer these questions? And we have chosen a simulation based approach. So we use a simulation. And for that, we have the what we call the digital urban climate twin of Singapore. So the digital urban climate twin is a digital urban twin, but one that is specifically designed and built uh, to study the urban climate. And then of course, we hope that uh, the insights gained from all these experimentations and the capabilities that this digital urban climate twin gives you will help with the urban planning and climate informed policy. Um, the hard sort of the hard piece of the duct um, is the federation of models. This is basically where all the models are. It's not one single model. We actually have a collection of models. Uh, they can be uh, roughly grouped into two categories, the urban climate models. And here we talk about mesoscale and microscale models in our case, um, and anthropogenic heat emission models. Um, and there we have a variety. So we have models that simulate the heat emissions by industry or the traffic or the building, building air conditioning. So there could be others as well. And this uh, federation of models that you see here is specific to a digital urban climate twin. Um, if you build a digital urban twin for other purposes, then you probably have a different set of models. But I would say every digital urban twin will have more than one model. Um, so that goes back to my earlier definition that I showed at the beginning. It's really a collection of multiple models, specialized models for different things. Um, we also have applications that we build. Um, these are just some uh, impressions of uh, what the duct applications will look like in the future. The whole idea is that uh, not everyone is, uh, has the skills to directly work with the models themselves. So we build applications for uh, urban planners, designers, decision makers uh, in the Singapore government agencies, but also the researchers in Cooling Singapore um, can use these applications. So they basically make it more easy, uh, they make it easier for people to use all these uh, all these models that the digital urban climate twin um, has to offer. When it comes to the system architecture, um, there's three layers. The first one is the application layer. So that's basically the applications that we have. Um, I've shown a screenshot there, um, some impressions in the previous slide. Um, then there's of course the computation layer that performs all the number crunching and, and comes up with all the, the results. That's the federation of models. Um, but all that rests on the shoulders of some infrastructure. And this infrastructure is um, basically the simulation as a service middleware. And that's what the talk is going to focus on. So let me first introduce um, what the simulation as a service approach is about. And then I talk about some of the highlights um, that I think are worthwhile mentioning. And that can probably also perhaps be um, further discussed in, in the, um, after the presentation. Um, so yeah, SARS stands for simulation as a service. Some of you know the, the SARS acronym also as software as a service. To be honest, in this particular case, it's probably, the, you know, if you call it software as a service, that's probably also fine. It's definitely not wrong. But in our case, we actually refer to it as simulation as a service. 
So what is the approach? The concept is really um, the idea is to make running simulations as easy as interacting with web services. Um, user provides some input, they trigger the simulations, um, and they collect the output when the job is done. That's sort of ideally how it would be, right? So you have some input, um, you have some processor as we call it, which could be a model A or a model B. It produces some output. You take the output and do something else with it. Um, but the idea is that it would really be very simple and, and without much technical overhead. Now in a digital urban twin, as I already mentioned, you have multiple models, um, multiple models, you have converters and you have all sorts of other processes and somehow you have to put all these things together. And this requires what in software engineering is referred to as a middleware. Um, there's a screenshot what I took from Wikipedia. And the one thing that I think describes it best is middleware is a glue. It's the glue that brings together all these components, takes care of the communication between the, communi uh, between the components um, in the context of a particular application. In, in our case, in the context of the digital urban twins, um, the purpose of the SaaS middleware is to take care of all the technical complexities, basically the putting together part um, and not bother the user with the, um, with the how to get stuff to work part, right? So that should be taken care of so the user can focus on their experiments instead. Uh, this slide is probably the most technical slide and don't worry, I won't go into all the details. Um, it, the SaaS middleware is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer system. So there is the notion of nodes. Um, you can have multiple nodes in your system. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, one node may run somewhere in the Google Cloud, another node may run on your in-house computing cluster, another node may run on your supercomputing uh, center. So the thing is your models have to run in different environments and we have to somehow all stitch this all together. So the idea is that wherever you want to run something, you have a node that is operating there and then the middleware would take care of all the, the glue uh, making uh, things to work together. Uh, I just want to highlight three things, uh, three components. The first one is the data object repository. As the name suggests, the data object repository uh, stores data objects, manages access to them, and keeps data provenance records. That's important because I will mention an important use case for that later. What data provenance is, is basically a complete history of um, how a data object has been created. The second component, uh, the second key component is the runtime infrastructure. And as the name suggests, that basically executes your jobs and um, using the various processes that you have deployed on that particular node. So the data object repository manages the data and the runtime infrastructure runs your simulations. Essentially, that's what it is. And then there's of course the SaaS application. They would um, communicate with the SaaS nodes in uh, using standard interfaces. And the SaaS applications, of course, they are domain specific. So uh, an application for the digital urban climate twin in cooling Singapore will look different than um, for another kind of application, perhaps in the future cities lab context. Um, there's another application that I haven't mentioned before, but this one is more generic. It's what we call the dashboard. And the dashboard application is used to directly interact with the SaaS infrastructure. So I mentioned earlier the runtime infrastructure and the data object repository. And the dashboard app would allow you to basically interact with it. Uh, this includes job submissions and monitoring of jobs using the runner, as we call it, and the runner basically interacts with the RTI. Um, you can also search, view, and manage data objects using the data object browser, uh, which would be interacting with the data object repository components of your nodes. So this application is already there up and running. We are currently, uh, I mean, we're developing everything, but this is already there. Um, so this is something that people can already use today. Um, the challenge, okay, so the, this, this, up to this point, I just gave some, some brief idea of what the SaaS middleware is about. Um, and now I want to uh, get to a couple of highlights. The first highlight is that um, if you work with a digital urban twin, um, let's say for a what if analysis, um, unless it's a trivial case, you will end up having to run multiple models as part of a potentially very complex workflow. Um, I have an example here on the right hand side. This is a real example of um, how we uh, determine or how we calculate the UHI map in cooling Singapore. And the way how we do it is basically we run two simulations. 
or two kinds of simulations, one with the with an urban scenario, that's the one that you see here on top, that's the urbanized uh, Singapore, compared to a hypothetical all green scenario. The urban heat island uh, is per definition a, a, a consequence of having a city. Cities produce ur an urban heat island. If you don't have a city, you don't have an urban heat island effect. So we thought, well, if you want to uh, quantify the urban heat island, um, then we have a scenario that we can easily do in the simulation without the city. And that's basically what this is, this workflow. So first you have to do some pre-processing and then you get something out of it, a wolf package it's called here. Uh, then you have to actually put this into the wolf simulation. By the way, wolf is, the, is our mesoscale uh, climate simulation and you get some climate data out of it. You do the same thing with the uh, all green scenario, go through the several steps, you get something out of it and then you take the calculation, the difference and then ultimately you get that UHI map. Now, at the moment, each of these processes here, the pre-processing as well as the simulations um, would, in, would actually usually require someone sitting in front of a computer, sitting in front of a, a, a terminal, um, logging into a, a computing cluster or maybe the National Supercomputing Center here in Singapore, log in, modify some files, run something, execute things, collect your data. So there's a lot of manual work involved. And what we can do with the simulation as a service middleware is that we can basically uh, put this, um, define a higher order processor or a workflow composition, put this in a box um, and basically uh, make it easier for the user to, to do this. So you basically define certain steps, uh, build a higher order processor, and then you basically can use it with a more or less with a single click um, as opposed to having to manually do every th single step manually. So that saves a lot of time, but it also reduces the amount of, or the chances, the risk for uh, human error along the way, because you have to deal with a lot of files, a lot of data, all this has to be somehow put together. There's a lot of manual work involved. And then as I said, it's not just time consuming, it also um, typically error prone, if you're not careful. Another highlight is model coupling. Now that's actually a challenge as well. Um, because the, the thing is all these models, they don't, um, they don't just run in isolation, just how the urban elements that these models represent are, don't exist in isolation, they affect each other. Uh, the same applies to the respective models. And uh, one example here is highlighted is the example of building air conditioning. So the air conditioners produce a lot of waste heat um, that is uh, heating up the local environment around the buildings. Um, and the warmer it is, the more energy your air conditioner needs to spend in order to keep the indoor temperature at a certain preferred temperature. So there's this feedback loop between the ambient temperature, which is essentially covered here by the climatic data, which comes out of the urban climate model, but the urban climate model also takes the output of the anthropogenic heat emission model. So there is this loop here, and how do you do that? Um, actually, in this particular case, uh, WARF has a building energy model already included. Um, and that is an example of what I describe as tight coupling. So tight coupling is the case where the modeling software already supports it. Um, either because the model itself has two subcomponents, say the building energy model and the um, um, atmospheric model, um, or each model has a, supports a certain interface. Um, there's for instance, this IEEE 1516 standard about HLA, high level architecture, that's basically about this tight coupling and uh, allowing different models to interact at runtime. So they, so they evolve or they, they process step-by-step step in, um, in, in sync. Um, it's technically very involved and unless your model is already supporting it, the model software is already supporting this, it's very difficult to add uh, because you have to dig into the model software itself. Uh, loose coupling on the other hand doesn't require that. Uh, you can treat the models as a black box but you would end up uh, running things in the loop. And typically you do this until you reach some convergence. And the problem there is that it, there is no guarantee of convergence and then what do you do? So model coupling is not easy to do, but there's basically different ways of doing it. Uh, loose coupling is directly and explicitly supported by the SaaS middleware. And tight coupling, as I said, requires support by the underlying modeling software. So it's, it's not, um, you can do that as well. The SaaS middleware is not preventing you, or it's not stopping you from doing that. Um, what it means for the user, uh, you can have dedicated workflows uh, and higher order processors actually that can take care of the, the looping part. 
So there's a lot of um, boilerplate stuff where the middleware can help you to do this. Another highlight is uh, when it comes to cloud and high performance computing, I already mentioned this before. Um, the issue is that the models usually have very specific runtime requirements. Some require high performance computing, others don't. Some run on your laptop, um, other models require more. Uh, there's also software dependencies. Uh, you sometimes uh, your, your model requires a certain version of Linux or a certain version of something else. And you just don't have that on your laptop. So you have to run it somewhere else where this is actually installed. There's also organizational, uh, organizational and administrative constraints. Um, you may not have the right to install a particular model on your computer. So for instance, in Cooling Singapore, we're intending to use um, the SingV climate model that is currently developed by the Center for Climate Research in Singapore. And, and they have a license for uh, the modeling software, which we don't have. So we, we can't just uh, take that software and run it on our side, um, apart from not having the computational um, uh, resources. So instead, this thing will be running on the National Supercomputing Center. So if you have a digital urban twin, uh, with non-trivial models, you will end up in a situation where you probably have to use a mix of cloud computing resources, supercomputing resources, and your own uh, computing resources in the internet. Now, the good thing is that once you have the SaaS infrastructure deployed, you don't actually have to worry about it anymore. That's the good thing about the, the middleware. It really takes care of these things. Uh, you may not even need to know where your model exactly is running. You may still want to know this because maybe you prefer to run model A here and model B there. You may have some, some knowledge about where things, where things are happening, but in principle, technically it's not required. The middleware will take care of it. Um, and I think that is a big advantage because a lot of people, um, I mean, many people don't have the knowledge how to use a supercomputer, how to, how to manage this. Uh, also with cloud computing, how do we set up uh, cloud instances? How do we run them? How do we um, monitor things? So there are a lot of technical stuff involved that the usual user, I think, shouldn't have to be bothered with. Another highlight uh, is on the issue of reproducibility. And I think this is a particular challenge. Uh, well, in science in general, reproducibility is a major principle. In computational science, um, again, it's, it's a very big issue because um, you need to have data, you need to have models. And everyone who has worked with models and data, ask yourself, are you able to reproduce, even you yourself as the author, are you able to reproduce experiments that you, simulation experiments that you have performed, let's say six, year, six months ago, or maybe a year ago? Uh, and I think in many cases, the answer is, if you're honest with, with each other, it's maybe not so easy. Why? Well, the model has maybe changed and maybe people haven't used something like Git repositories to keep track of the changes. So you don't exactly know which version of your model you have been using. Data may have gone missing or hasn't been kept properly or has been modified ever since. So there's a lot of, a lot of issues there. And it's not just, um, of course, in modeling and simulation, but reproduci reproducibility is a big issue in science. And um, I found this paper and they say something interesting along the lines of uh, reproducibility is the minimum necessary condition for finding to be believable and informative. Um, the flip side of it is if you can't guarantee or if you can't provide reprodu reproducibility, what does this say about the believability uh, of your work and the credibility of your work? That's a big issue. There's no silver bullet, but um, how the SaaS middleware can help here is, um, first of all, the data object repository keeps um, systematically track of all the data objects, uh, unique IDs and so on. But I also mentioned earlier that he keeps the entire history of how a data object has been generated. So let's say you start off with two data objects. I'm just going through this in a very abstract way, but you start with two data objects. You put this into a processor and you get something out of it. You use that outcome and use it with another data object and you run another simulation or another analysis. And again, you get something out of it. So this is sort of the hist this graph here is basically the history of this data object e 9 b 678 so if I wanted to know how someone has actually come to this conclusion, not to this conclusion, but to this data set that I may use in my publication to come to certain conclusions, how has this been generated? Um, in, with our system, we can, we can tell you exactly how this thing has been uh, created and you can in principle exactly reproduce it. Um, I put exactly here in parentheses because it doesn't always work that way. So this, there's always 
there can be edge cases where exactly reproducibility just cannot be guaranteed, but it does help with a lot of things. So it's not a silver bullet, as I said, but it does help uh, researchers. I, I believe it, it can help researchers to do better science, computational science in particular. Uh, it also helps you uh, to avoid unnecessary computation because if you have that graph and someone else is trying to do this plus this, uh, the system already knows, well, we've already done this, someone else has already done this and, and can directly point you at this outcome. Okay, so these are just some of the highlights. Uh, I wanna talk about adoption. So let's say, okay, that sounds all interesting, but actually what do we have to do in order to use this simulation as a service stuff? Um, well, the first thing is you would have to set up the infrastructure. Um, and this can be done for an entire organization, for instance, the SEC, um, if, if, they, if they wish to do so. Uh, it can also be done for individual programs or projects. Um, the Future Cities Lab, for instance, or in Cooling Singapore, we do this for the Digital Urban Climate Twin. But yeah, you have to set up the technical infrastructure. You also need to onboard the model component. So let's say you have a model. We have these climate models, we have building energy models, we have traffic models, we have quite a number of models. So at, at the beginning, you need to onboard um, these models. And onboarding specifically means that you basically write an adapter. You don't actually have to touch the, the models themselves or the code of the models. Uh, that's not the idea, but you build an adapter around it. And this adapter basically makes it, um, it, it makes it uh, interoperable with the rest of the SaaS um, uh, infrastructure. And then you may, and I think this is optional, but depending on what your application is about and who you're trying to um, gain as your users, um, you may want to develop some applications. Um, these graphical kind of applications that I showed earlier. Uh, that has to be domain specific. Um, as I said, for digital urban climate twin in the context of urban planning, the application will look different than um, maybe uh, for other use cases. It's optional. In principle, you don't need it. You can run simulations as well. So researchers may opt to just use the dashboard, the SAS dashboard that I mentioned earlier, just to utilize the models uh, or run workflows and then deal, uh, work with the data directly. So you don't actually need uh, these fancy uh, graphical user interfaces. Um, also, if you're aiming um, at maybe non-expert users to use your models, then you probably want to have those. You know, of course, that goes in in you know in iterations. I mean, if you, know, you start with one model, then the next model iteration, or you add another model to your mix, so that's something that you can repeat. Um, so I drew the line there because basically everything above the line is something that is more infrastructure um, and, and very development heavy in a sense because. So said you need to develop these adapters. Uh, what's below the line is more from the user's perspective. Um, the user wants to perhaps define workflows. It's optional. As I said, you don't have to, but it use, uh, workflows can be very useful. Higher order processes can be implemented, including the adapters. Um, uh, in the past, we also had this uh, possibility um, of just defining a workflow and then using a generic workflow processor. Um, and that will also be at some point again available be in the SaaS middleware. Uh, and then comes of course the, the part where you, um, where you actually run experiments which may include importing data. That's important only in, in the beginning because the assumption is that at some point you will have all your data in the, in the system and the platforms. So you don't actually need to import new data. Um, you run the experiments um, and then of course you may want to export the data um, to analyze the data further. Uh, you don't necessarily need to export the data. If you have these uh, front-end applications, this may already be sufficient for your purposes. But so this is roughly how adoption of the SaaS middleware looks like. Obviously, there's all the uh, details um, which, um, which are not seen here, but in, in, by and large, I would say these are the, the major steps. And then of course, that can also go in, in the loop. Um, you're not only running one experiment, you will probably perform many experiments. Um, okay, so this was an overview of um, the SaaS middleware and what you can do with it and how adoption will look like, roughly speaking. I would like to give you a, some idea of where we're heading as well. Um, the first thing is our roadmap. Um, this is a very, just a very uh, rough view of the roadmap, but basically uh, we are planning to have an alpha test net for our SaaS middleware stuff. Uh, which will probably run sometime between November and February 22. 
and uh, it's mostly for internal users. Uh, we basically just want to iron out um, all the sort of like the bigger issues that we that we see so that um, everything works nicely, uh, which will be followed by a beta test net. And this beta test net is actually going to be very interesting because this is really when we uh, will reach out to end users. So for instance, we will be inviting people from the government agencies to use the digital urban climate twin that we are developing in cooling Singapore. Um, so it's not just internal anymore. It's really going to go uh, live and external. It may not be the final system yet, but it's we're really hoping to get um, real user feedback so that we can make sure that the system really provides the services and the user experience that uh, is required for people to do what they want to do with this digital urban twin. Um, we are also planning at some point um, to deploy this digital urban climate twin, digital urban climate twin in uh, in the wild, so to say. Uh, maybe I should mention this as well about the Cooling Singapore project because that may be something that is uh, perhaps a bit unique or a bit special about the project. Um, the Cooling Singapore is not an academic uh, research project as many of you know it. Um, we are actually have a real um, task and a real mission to build a digital urban climate twin and make it usable for the agencies and also deploy it or help the agencies to, to deploy it in the in the wild in um, for them to use. So we're going fairly beyond way beyond the point of just building a proof of concept. Um, so this is going to be on a very high uh, technology readiness level. Um, we are probably aiming at seven. So that's sort of pre-commercialization. Um, and I think that's maybe um, something I should mention here as well. So we will work towards deployment of it as well. We are also working on a website. Um, the applications that you saw earlier, uh, the, the runner or the dashboard as we're going to call it, as well as the duct applications builder or integrator, um, they're gonna be web-based. So they will run in your browser. Um, and we thought it would be good to have a website as well that not only gives people some background and information about the digital urban climate twin, but also the entry point, like how to use the apps, where to get uh, to the apps. And that will be on a website. Um, the launch of the website is probably going to be later this year, or early next year. Okay, now, and this is the, I have one slide on, I hope, um, can serve as, a, as an opening for a discussion, for a broader discussion with the Future Cities Lab. Because um, I know from my past experience and working from the Future Cities Lab, and I think with FCL Global is going to be exactly the same. FCL has developed quite a number of interesting tools. Uh, for visualization purposes, but and analysis purposes as well. So I just mentioned a few here. Singapore Views is one of them. Um, the other one is Earthscape. Fair Planner has been developed. Um, and there's also the City Energy Analyst. These are just four examples, and there's much more. And I think FCL Global will build even more. Um, some of these we have already worked with in the past. Building Singapore has uh, leveraged Singapore Views in the past for visualization purposes. Uh, we have also already uh, used city energy analysts. In fact, city energy, city energy analysts is one of the models that we have already onboarded in our own federation of models. And we are looking forward to do uh, a lot of work with it. Um, so, but these are very interesting applications. I don't exactly know, um, some may be just for visualization purposes, others actually have maybe not fully fledged uh, large scale simulations running, but some form of computation going on. And the question that I'm asking myself as well, why, why not try to um, uh, use these applications and, and make them compatible with the um, uh, SaaS middleware, uh, which could potentially also help to sort of have the standardization across FCL that should also allow to foster collaboration between different groups because people can use each other's models. Uh, and then we can have these visualization analysis apps sitting on top of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the question to me is um, how the SARS approach can help researchers in FCL. Um, and with that, I, uh, my last slide is basically, I want to hear from you. Uh, I want to learn about your use cases. And of course, I want to discuss how the SARS approach can be used to help with your modeling and simulation needs, FCL, but of course also beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Heiko. That, that that was a very stimulating presentation. There are a lot of questions I had on the 
in the earlier slides. And as you go on in the last slide is a provocation for us at FCL as well. Uh, so that got me thinking another direction. But um, I see there are a couple of questions in the chat box, which are more specific related to um, the workflow. Um, so maybe we can take those questions, but then uh, Michael, Yo, Steven, if you're around, uh, I would really like to hear from you uh, on uh, uh, what Heiko, pro, uh, Heiko's last slide, the provocation as well. So KW Lim, if you are here, would you unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? Okay, if not, then I can just read it out for everyone's benefit. It, he asks, um, uh, how sensitive are the model predictions of duct to workflow composition, sequence, order, spatial time granular granularity? And I also had a similar question, uh, Heiko, about uh, the level of detail, the granularity of uh, each of the individual, the input uh, data sets that you were talking about and how do we, is there, so there's a minimum, level of detail or there's a standard and then you kind of um, uh, you update it in your recipe that this is uh, this model is uh, has been updated with a new data layer okay uh, thank you for the questions they are very good questions um, they are also brought so there's a lot of stuff that I could say to it so I, I'll try to answer um, them by one by one um, the question about the model predictions and uh, sensitivity so there is a I think there is a bigger issue when it comes to model validation as well. So typically we talk about validating one model and the other, but the bigger question is also, okay, but now we're putting them together and we build a model composition. Is that composition actually valid? Uh, just because the components are validated doesn't mean that the composition is valid. So you probably want to validate the composition as well. Um, that's an issue that we are aware of it and we are, we're working on um, ways to do this. Generally, um, about granularity, uh, workflow composition, um, it, it depends very much on what you want to do with it. Um, so in terms of uh, resolution, it depends what you want to do with the data, what you want to uh, do with the models, what you want to get out of it. So it's a bit difficult to, um, to give a, a general answer to it. Um, obviously, um, we have some use cases in mind that we want to do with the digital urban climate twin. So we have this, uh, the other big part that Cooling Singapore is working on is what we call the what if scenarios. Uh, that questions such as, okay, um, where identify the wind corridors in Singapore? Um, uh, how sensitive are these wind corridors to changes in the urban planning? Um, how can we protect these uh, wind corridors? Um, so if you want to do this, then you need to ask yourself to what level of detail do you need to simulate this? And of course, make sure that the models that the digital urban climate twin is using is supporting this. Um, in general, we use different types of models. I mentioned earlier, uh, mesoscale and microscale. Um, so the mesoscale simulation, for instance, is used on a, that's a basically a 300 by 300 meter spatial resolution, um, but it's covering the whole of Singapore. Um, then uh, we also have the microscale models, which is more on the neighborhood scale, and that uh, can be full-blown CFD simulations at a very high level of um, precision, um, resolution. Uh, but we also use uh, surrogate models. Um, the reason why we use surrogate models is because some of the, especially the climate models, they take a lot of time to execute. So maybe what if you have a thousand scenarios that you want to run or a thousand uh, simulation runs, maybe you want to start with a surrogate model and get a rough estimate of like, you know, out of those thousand variations that we have, maybe those 900, they, they, they are completely off the mark. We don't even want to look at them. And then you look into more detail in, 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 in your shortlist. So the, the digital urban climate twin does not tell you that you have to use this particular model combination, but you use different models for different purposes. I also like to sometimes explain the Federation of Models as a toolbox. You have many tools in there and we will have many urban climate model um, types in there and you will use the whatever tool that serves the particular need. Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether that answered the question, but I mean, the, the point is basically, you, you need to make sure that your model does is the right, it basically, if you, have a, if you have a nail, you need a hammer. 
and you want to make sure that you have the right tool. I, I, I hope that clarifies a bit. Yeah, uh, definitely. But there's more follow up questions, but I would maybe just move on to uh, Miguel Martin and his question about building energy models that are integrated in the infrastructure. Martin, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah, hello, Dr. Eiko. Yes, Miguel Martin. Yes, from the Berkeley Alliance. So thank you very much for this uh, presentation. And especially I like, you know, the part of when you explain, you know, the SIS, you know, infrastructure, and especially your efforts to create several adapters, you know, to facilitate the integration of different uh, simulation engines. So I presume also for climate, building energy and all those stuff, because it made me think a little bit uh, like the, what the Berkeley laboratory tried to achieve with the BCV TV uh, middleware, but in a more modern version. So for that reason, my question for you would be, so what kind of building energy models are you able to integrate in the, in the current version of your SAS uh, infrastructure? So for instance, are you able to integrate uh, Energy Plus or such kind of detailed building energy models? Uh, if yes, so how? I would be very interested by how. Um, I haven't worked with Energy Plus myself, so I, uh, I'm, I can only you know, gener speak in general terms. But in principle, we can in incorporate any any model that allows you to. I think it's most it's not so much a limitation with the model; it's rather the modeling software how you're using it. Um, so we need a way to use the model without the graphical user interface, uh, and the reason for that is because we execute these models typically somewhere on some backend on a supercomputer, on a cloud, and there is no graphical user interface as such. So the user uh, isn't directly interacting with your model. So one requirement is that we are able to script the entire um, triggering of the model, um, collecting the data that comes out of it in some way. Uh, I think most models that we have encountered so far do usually support this, but there are also examples where um, uh, the models come, uh, the model software comes sort of in a package and it usually comes with a graphical user interface and then the actual simulation core. And if that is packaged in such a way that you cannot just utilize the simulation core, then it's, it's difficult um, or potentially even impossible. These are not model limitations as such. The model may, may, may very well work uh, for our purposes. It's just that we don't have the, from a software point of view, the, the, the ability to, um, to build this adapter around it. So I, without knowing Energy Plus, I've heard about it, but I haven't worked with it yet. I would say, yes, we can integrate it. So as long as there is a way to, to build this adapter around it, uh, I think that's the biggest limitation, the ability to build adapters. But especially for the compute heavy simulations, we have also used ANSYS Fluent, for instance, in the past. They tend to be, have a way of running without graphical user interface anyway, because they often support um, high performance computing. In, in, these, in these cases, uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't say straightforward, but it's relatively straightforward to integrate them. At least not from, there is no issue that stops us from a software engineering point of view. Okay, so in that case, uh, Dr. Eko, my coming question for you. So are you planning in the future to create like a general interface that would encapsulate all the different sub -interface, uh, interfaces from the different uh, models? Yeah, so actually, um, one way what you can do is obviously, for instance, take WARF. Um, it's a general purpose uh, climate uh, weather forecasting model. You can exactly. do you can do thousands of things with it. But what we do is we build an adapter that is already tailored to a particular use case. Now, nobody stops you from building multiple such adapters. Um, so one use case could be, I don't know, for the something that we use for urban climate and, and urban heat island simulations. Uh, you may want to use WAL for a different purpose and you actually have different kinds of inputs and produce different kinds of outputs. So in that case, you can produce, you can build another adapter around it. It's still the same WAL at the heart of it, but different wrappers. Um, and, and this can be done with, um, um, with other simulation models as well. Um, so in a way, these adapters are really ways of um, reducing the, uh, I guess the, 
the complexity of what goes in and what comes out because the adapter is already, um, so let's say you have a hundred variables that goes into your model, but depending on the use case out of those 100 variables, 90 are actually constants. Uh, only 10 are actually proper variables for which you need input. So the adapter would make sure that there's an adapter for this particular use case. And then those 90 variables, they would be set to that set constant and only expose those 10 variables to the, um, to the rest of the environment. You can write another adapter, which was, would expose another set of variables, which allows you to do another case. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting work here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you make it sound so easy, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, oh. I, it, it's like a magic solution in my head. But I, there's so many interesting questions here in the chat box. I hope we can go through all of them, but uh, uh, we go through it by sequence. And Stephen asked the reiterate the question about the quality of data. Stephen, would you like mm -hmm. to? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be quick. Um, yeah, I agree. It has this kind of magic quality. So I'm just pitching myself as a as a as a sort of user, non non computer science, but I'm interested, of course, in the origin of the data and the origin of the knowledge. So I'm sort of critical enough to know that I'm suspicious of certain kinds of material that's coming to me, but I want to be able to use it. And I, I really loved your reflection on metadata. Um, how, how does that kind of work? So that also assumes, I suppose, that this is quite an open, this is quite an open system, you know, this is the yeah. federation kind of models. Is, is this a responsibility of the user then who, who needs to understand about metadata and then check um, and, and be in a way critically aware of, of the, 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 the metadata and the heritage of the data and the models, of course, could you just reflect a bit more on that slide and that, that segment of your Yeah, argument? yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Um, so the system allows you, makes it easier to use models, but there's of course a danger that, um, you know, just because you, you, you put certain things in, just because it matches the, you know, in computer science, we have to say in garbage in, garbage out, and the same with models. Mm -hmm. So if you just mindlessly put things in without thinking, then your outcome is probably not reliable. So as the user, um, you probably need to know a little bit, of, you, you need to have some knowledge about the data and the metadata, uh, the meta information can definitely help you to better uh, evaluate what's actually in the data set. Um, the, where does the data come from? What potential issues may this data have? The system allows you to tag the data in, 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 in a very, you can tag it in whichever way you want. You can also search for it whichever way you want. Um, so there's not a technical limitation of providing this sort of meta information, but I think it depends also on the on the applica application domain. So in the mm. domain of uh, cooling Singapore, it's all about urban climate. So you, you want to make sure that the data has this right kind of meta information that is important for 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 people who are looking into urban climate. Right. Um, and I think that is mostly the responsibility of the domain experts because. On the, level, on the technical level, I don't know anything about your models and your domain, right? So I, I can't put this meta information in apart from the mm -hmm. technical stuff, like technical stuff thing, like the, what is the spatial resolution? I mentioned WARF uses 300 by 300 meter. That's the sort of thing that we can put in, but maybe sort of more domain specific uh, meta information. I think that has to come from the user. And then the user yeah. has to know what to, what to make out of this metadata. Yeah. Super. I mean, just this is absolute music to our ears and FCL. So your last couple of slides are very valuable because we have, um, you know, users all the way from architects, uh, humanities, social science people. But for us to be involved in this discussion, which is absolutely crucial, I, I, we need this kind of open, open and yet critically available sort of kind of technology. So super. Looking forward. I mean, I, I guess I should also say because. Um, as you said, uh, as Tanvi also said, it sounds magical. It's not the silver bullet. Um, yeah. I think a lot of it is is in a way good engineering, good software engineering from the point we define clear interfaces and there's a lot of flexibility there. But as I said, you have to be careful what you do as well. Just because you can plug all these things together, it doesn't necessarily make sense. So mm. the domain experts have to be aware of these things as well. But at least what a system can do is it can make the uh, the technical stuff a lot easier so that the users can actually focus on what they really want to do and don't get sidetracked with trying to get stuff to work on the cloud or the supercomputer. Mm. Super, thanks. NK has a interesting question about the application of this work in financial sector. Finn, would you like to unmute and ask the question yourself? 
Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, can hear you well. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so uh, I'm totally from a, uh, probably I'm not sure whether this is a kind of a good question to ask. So um, you, you talk about like a social planners uh, for your system, right? So uh, one potential kind of important pl planner in an urban environment is the, the financial plan, uh, which involves, let's say, firms and household as well. Uh, so in, in my mind, kind of maybe the, the, the key thing is like the, the firms uh, operating in an urban environment. So they may have uh, different offices and also factories in different parts of the of the urban environment, uh, and also involves like uh, the the climate related data as well as other uh, like non climate related data, including financial etc. Right. So I just wonder, like for your system platform, uh, do you only allow climate related information as inputs, or you allow any any other things as well? Second is, and. Uh, a kind of uh, do you allow kind of the, the financial aspect of the of the of the system in terms of like uh, planning and also outcomes? Um, in the digital urban climate twin, so far we are not working with financial data. Uh, it could be done. Um, for instance, some there's also always the question about um, I guess trade-offs. Like for instance, um, mitigation strategies, implementing st mitigation strategy A or B. One may be a lot more costly, uh, but perhaps more effective. The other one may be not as costly, but perhaps only with limited um, effectiveness. Um, for planners, this is obviously important because they want to know the trade-offs. Um, uh, and, and I think they do this. It's not current in our system, but there is no technical limitation. I mean, you can also include these kind of, um, this kind of data or this kind of information in your models, um, attach it to your data. Um, so yeah, there, there is no limitation to it, but it depends on, on if you need it. In our case, we haven't needed it so far. Okay, so essentially that means kind of, we could bring our models into your platform and, uh, and build on what you have already. Yeah, okay. I mean, Thank you. just talking, what comes to mind from a financial sector point of view is, um, you know, I guess there is, if you consider the future markets where you uh, trade futures on commodities, for instance, this is often used as an insurance depending on whether your harvest is going to be good or bad. And I could imagine any sort of climate simulations have some impact on, um, I don't know, how the harvest might be in June or July or for, I don't know, your, your cotton or whatever it is that you're, that you're dealing with. And you could probably, uh, you know, you use the climate forecast for this in order to figure out how pricing should be in, in a couple of months from now. I'm, I'm really just making this up, but I mean, there, there, there is probably a link between, uh, certainly between climate and finance. Insurance is another topic. Um, insurance companies uh, need to um, sort of quantify the risk of certain uh, extreme weather events. And again, this is obviously highly related to climate. So the financial aspect can come in, yes. Yeah, so, so do you allow, so my understanding is, so for example, like in, in Singapore, we have like thousands of firms, right? Tens of thousands of firms. So do you model, like for example, in your platform, do you allow each firm as a node or maybe each office building as a node? We could. I mean, one thing that we do is we analyze um, the different kind of uh, building uh, cooling systems, centralized cooling, district, uh, district cooling, and so on. Um, it's, we, we are usually concerned in the effectiveness in, in, in terms of energy savings and where the heat is being emitted. Um, you could in bring a cost model as well. It says, look, I mean, there's so and so many companies, uh, so many buildings or building um, owners. And, you know, if they would switch to a different kind of cooling system, decentralized cooling, that would sort of affect their bottom line so much because now the cost is higher, but in the long term, it will sort of reduce. So you can bring in these things and you can, in principle, model these things. I mean, there is no limitation as to the type of models that you can bring in. So I could imagine you can bring in an agent-based model that um, perhaps simulates, you know, the complexity between like you have so many different players, actors, firms that somehow interact with each other and that somehow, uh, you know, link this to, to some financial or some, 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 some urban climate data. Um, I'm not saying it, it makes sense. I'm just saying it can be done. I mean, obviously someone else would have to do the thinking whether that makes any sense, but in principle it's possible. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Vin. Uh, the next question is from San Joyce uh, from um, SUTD Meta Design Lab about the security of the platform. Sam, would you like to unmute and ask a question yourself? Ah, uh, sure. Yeah, uh, I hope it's not too loud. Um, uh, I'm I'm in a cafe at the moment. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. Really, really interesting. Um, we've been working on on Virtual Singapore, which is a sort of desktop platform. And I guess my question is less to do with security, but more how we sort of integrate all of these platforms. You know, I think there's some really great work being done. There's this question about how they work. So I'm using this sort of word, sort of walled garden, you know, especially some of the commercial platforms are very difficult to, to begin to sort of integrate together. And, you know, I, I wondered what your thoughts were there. I mean, I've always kind of been interested in things like Tim Berners-Lee's ideas of you know, the semantic web, et cetera. But in reality, yeah. of course, we have some huge players like Google and Amazon that are kind of dealing yeah. with more generally the kind of broad technology. I wonder how we kind of get out of that and, and work in an interoperable and collaborative way with these yeah. various platforms. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that because uh, I think it's like a critical problem in, in what we're doing. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely love the question uh, because it mentions a good point. Um, I think there is benefit in openness. Um, I think the times where you have your, your system and you have your own standards, your own interfaces, and you really don't want anyone else to use it, I think those times are gone. Um, the, the, in, the networking uh, helps a lot, the ability to leverage on other people's work. So that's all great. Uh, and I think it, it's going into this direction anyway. But there's still the problem of like, okay, fine. Um, you know, there's certain things which are just confidential and there's absolutely no way we're gonna let you have a look at this particular data set. So there is this problem that I have this model, you have the data, I don't trust you, you don't trust me. How do we get this together? So we've actually been thinking about this. And in, in, in fact, we have especially exactly this use case we've discussed with the agencies because we do have some issues about the data and we have a solution for that. Um, uh, I made mean, a simple solution in, 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 in case of cooling Singapore, that's something that works is that basically um, the agencies can set up a sort of like a, a secure system, for instance, they keep their data there. Um, our model will run on their end with our infrastructures easily doable and, and whatever comes out of the model is something they can review and then agree whether or not they want to release it or not. The point is we can run our algorithms on their data without their data ever leaving uh, their walled garden. That's a particular use case that we've discussed. Uh, there's more sophisticated uh, use cases possible as well. I've, I've thought about other things as well. Uh, so it's definitely a very interesting area and we, we can do this already today. So if, you know, if there's a specific problem then in, along these lines then it's definitely something we can do today. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I, I think we can move on to the final question from by Jonas. Jonas, if you're still here, would you unmute yourself and ask a question? Well, thanks a lot, Heiko. Very interesting work. As I said in my in my comments, I wonder what do you expect the Singaporean agencies to apply it? Is it to improve urban planning? Is it to identify risk or is it all together? Is it about to raise awareness? Where do you see the the tool that you developed could actually change uh, Singapore. Yes, um, very specific in our case, um, the digital urban climate twin, uh, the mission is to build a uh, this, this urban twin specifically so that the agencies can uh, do better planning or sometimes it's called climate informed planning. So the idea is that they would be able to evaluate different scenarios. What if we do this? Uh, so maybe let okay, but if we say we use district cooling here or centralized cooling there, um, what if we uh, use pocket parks, small lots of smaller parks? What if we have larger parks? Um, how how would this affect the urban climate? And this is information or with these insights they can do their decision making. I mean, obviously they make decisions based on I don't know probably ten and more criteria. Uh, climate is only one of them, but our tool would allow them to play around with different scenarios with different design options and see what the impact on the uh, or the expected impact on the urban climate would be. And then they can basically put this into their uh, into their into into their decision making process and say, look, 
uh, we have these five options. Um, you know, the cost is this, um, preference by people perhaps is that, but then we also have the, the slightly more, um, um, you know, the, 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 the quantitative input that the digital urban climate twin can give them. So ultimately it depends what you wanna do with the digital urban twin, but in our case, in Cooling Singapore's case, in the case of the digital urban climate twin, um, the, uh, the, the idea is that the agencies would be able to uh, use the insights that they gain uh, from running the simulations, from experimenting with what if scenarios, uh, basically to make better informed decisions. Yeah, Heiko, the, you used the word what if right in the beginning of the presentation. And I think that's like the key to what you're doing. It's become so important for planners and the agencies in practice to become more agile. The uh, cities mm -hmm. are complex and uh, uncertainty as we see now is just growing to be able to be more agile with your process and run what if scenarios more easily is the need of the hour. So in, there, in that case, you're addressing, you're right on point. If you have time, could we take one more question from Christian right now? Uh, Christian, sure. would you unmute yourself? Yes, yeah. hello from Zurich. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm not a modeler, so I'm, I'm from the outside. I'm an urbanist. I have a question about your approach. Can you couple different modeling types? There are models, for example, agent-based models and non-agent-based models, and they have very different mathematics behind. So can you couple them? And if you couple them, mm -hmm. does, does that lead to specific problems? Uh, yes, we can couple them. Uh, in fact, the digital urban climate twin already is using different types of models, including uh, agent-based traffic simulation. So we already have uh, experience with agent-based models. When it comes to coupling, it's mostly the, as I said, there's basically two ways to do it. Either the modeling software already supports it, in which case you can do uh, what I consider tight coupling. Um, that's very technically involved. It would basically mean the two models evolve step-by-step step in sync. Um, as the simulation runs. The other one, the loose coupling approach is that you run one model, take the output, put it into uh, as input of the other model, run that, take that output, take it again as the input. Of, so you basically get this, this loop. Um, there is no limitation as to, if, 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 from this point of view, the models are black boxes. It, it, it doesn't matter what's inside, whether it's an agent based model or a CFD model, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, yeah, runtime question. matters, of course. But uh, the issue that potentially is with this with this loop approach is you you don't have a guarantee of convergence. So the idea is that um, you know, depending on how, how how hot it is outside, the air conditioning using that much amount of energy, uh, depending on how much energy they use, there will be more waste heat produced. Um, now it's a bit hotter outside, so the again when you run it the next time, the building energy model means uh, will require a bit more energy. But the idea is if you run this a couple of times, it it will sort of like flatten out to the point where it converges and there's not more, you don't observe many more changes in the system. Maybe I have That's to great, more, but- Maybe it's less, so precise. My question is about aggregation and granularity. If there are different uh, aggregations and granularity in the ah, model, then the coupling okay. suddenly needs to, to problems of scale. You have different granularity. I see. Need. Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's potentially an issue. I mean, if you run a- uh, a high resolution model and a low resolution model to, to each other uh, with each other. One way is okay, right? If you have high resolution data, you aggregate it, well, that's fine. Uh, but the other way around isn't possible because there's always an information loss when you when you go from the high resolution to the low resolution. Um, then there's the question whether is this okay? It may still be okay in your in your particular use case. Um, you can, for instance, try to figure this out with sensitivity analysis um, and, and and see how sensitive um, your a higher resolution model is to, uh, to, to changes in the input and then see whether uh, your low resolution model is, is still satisfactory. There's probably other ways of doing this as well. Um, but yeah, so there are potential issues. You can't just couple everything. Uh, that goes back to what I said earlier, just because you can plug it together doesn't mean it produces anything meaningful. So you, you have to know what you're doing. There is no technical reason why you can't couple these things, but it, you know, it, it may just produce garbage. So you have to be a little bit careful that you're not just um, going overboard with this. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so with that, I think we are right on time to end the presentation. 
I hope uh, the talk inspired you, new, uh, inspired new ideas. I think this is the opening for a longer conversation, also an invitation to collaborate and then take the idea forward. Uh, you can reach uh, Heiko on the website that he uh, flashed at the end of his uh, presentation. Also, a recording of this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel, at CR YouTube channel, so you can uh, look out for that. Uh, so with that, I'd like to end the session. Thank you so much, Heiko, for this uh, lovely presentation. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for, uh, for all the, to the audience for, for, for listening to me. Thank you also for the very good questions. I absolutely loved it. And I'm looking forward to have future discussions. Thank you.